Father, these precious ones came from all kinds of houses, all kinds of streets, all kinds of towns, all kinds of cities, all kinds of countries. And they determined to come to this place at this time. And they determined to know you better at this place. And so we ask you to open their capacity larger and let them receive more than they even thought. Yes. Let that faith spring up yes. so strong until they can do things they never dreamed of. And let them leave here with a full, totally full, that their whole total being will be full. Nobody half full. I believe you to bless every one of these precious lives. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Before you sit down, turn to the next one. Say, Mind, you look pretty tonight. In Ephesians chapter 6, we all being on the same scriptures the whole week, looks like. Verse 10 says, Finally, brethren, <laughs> how many believe that sisters too? Only sisters said anything. How many means believe brethren means sisters? Amen. Okay. Finally, be strong in your doctrine. Be strong in your denomination. This bunch here are going to be strong in Jehovah as sure as we're in this room. Amen. We're going to be strong in Jehovah. Yeah. Our strength will not be in what we know right. and what we can do. Our strength will be in Jehovah. Right. Yes, we're going to win victories, mighty victories. Supernatural things will take place. They will take place. But our strength will be in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. God knew you wouldn't get it the first word, so he just kept doubling it up on you. Strong in Jehovah, the power of his might, you see. So when you start to do something, don't think of your might, think of his might and the power of his might. Take on the whole armor of God. And then he comes to verse 12. And I want to read it to you, please, in the Living Bible. It says, for we are not, this is verse 12, chapter 6. We are not fighting against people. Say people. About 90% of all the energy I see expended in this country in the church is fighting people or organizations or something. Your, your, battle, your, battle, your battle is not with people. It says, we are not fighting against people made of flesh and blood, but against persons, say persons, against persons without bodies. Now, let, let, let's be honest. 95% of the church don't believe that. They just don't believe it. You think it's your mother-in-law? Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. Yeah. Now, I, I'm not in a place here to be funny, but I laughed the other day. I was reading that first scripture I gave you a while ago about Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost. And I laughed. And I said, you know, if the church people of today had been in control then, Peter would have missed the day of Pentecost. They'd have had him suspended still. Yeah. They'd have had him in some rehabilitation center, and he wouldn't have got to be there. You see? But I'm glad the Holy Ghost, you know, does things just a little different. You don't blame me for laughing, do you? Yeah. The Holy Ghost is so different from some people. <laughs> he flesh says, our battle is against persons without bodies. Evil rulers of the unseen world. The devil is the best organized outfit there is anywhere except heaven. Evil rulers of the unseen world. Mighty satanic beings. When we came against the devil in the Philippines, from that little girl that was bitten by devils, we hit the prince for sure. 
when she saw him, she said he would sit on a wall and his feet would touch the ground. I mean, like a city wall, uh, 10 or 12 feet high. His feet would touch the ground and his big old head was way up above the top of the wall. This creature that was disturbing her and destroying her. So when we hit him and knocked him off his throne, the Philippines had never had a great revival in its total history. Never had one yet. When he came tumbling off his throne and was beaten down in front of 120 spectators, the press, the world press, physicians, university professors, when he was knocked down and destroyed, and that little girl, I could change a dog into a human, became so beautiful and so lovely. That head doctor rushed me over to the mayor's office and walked in and said, my God, mayor, the devil is dead. <laughs> and I said, mayor, he's, he's slightly exaggerating. <laughs> I said, that girl is healed. That mayor wrapped his arms around me and loved me. After that, he came to my pulpit to preach. If we walked into a restaurant and he was there. He'd jump up and his little guards chasing after it, run clear across the restaurant, put his hands or arms around me and love me right in front of everybody. Just wasn't ashamed of it at all. And he said, what can I do for you? And I said, well, give me the plaza out in front of the city hall. And, and in six weeks' time there, we saw 150,000 people converted to Jesus. Yeah. The next year, Brother Roberts came just for one week. 25,000 people, including university professors and people like that, gave their hearts to Jesus there. And where's Sister Lindsay? And, and then about the next year, Brother Lindsay brought over that large group of people. Brother Cirilla was with them. And another 25 or 30,000 came to know the Lord. The devil didn't know what to do. We were just beating the daylights out of him. Not with one blow, but blow after blow. Until you can go there today, anybody. Richard and I are going to go over there together in December. And that made the devil shudder this morning. We decided that. Yeah, yeah. Thousands of people will be saved that night. God only knows how many will be healed. All kinds of miracles will take place. So we haven't stopped giving him a bad time. We knocked him off his throne. He has no more authority out there. And so we just keep beating him around. Because that's what ought to happen to him. Yeah. <laughs> The Bible says against the evil rulers of the unseen world and, and against mighty satanic beings, now this is your Bible too, and great evil princes of darkness. How many people, most churches, they wouldn't even let you read that verse in church. They said, man, you'd scare us to death. They wouldn't let you read it. Who rule this world against huge numbers of wicked spirits in this world. Did you know that not one place in the Bible has God ever told you to be afraid of the devil's power or the devil himself? Yeah. You're, you, you have more than he has. You have Jesus. And he is already bruised. And we're going to keep him bleeding. And you're a winner. Now, Here's an opportunity to change the whole world right now. In the Great Commission, Jesus said, they that have faith shall cast out devils. Say faith. faith. It does not say preachers. It does not say missionaries, deacons or elders. It says they that have faith shall cast out devils. Now, I was born and raised in Pentecost. My mother spoke in tongues before I was born. We heard so much tongues in my house and I was a boy, I didn't know which to use on the street, you know. <laughs> they were... They used them all the time. You know, in those days, they were fanatics anyway. <laughs> Blessed ones. In all my life, in the Pentecostal movement, I never heard a sermon in my life on how to cast out devils. Not one in all my life. If you were sick, we'd pray for you. <laughs> we'd always ended up with, say, if the Lord wills. Yes. That was escape hatch. If nothing happened, the preacher said, well, the Lord didn't will. <laughs> you see? So he could get off real easy. But if you lost your mind, we put you in the crazy house. Didn't bother about that. We put a few in the crazy house when I was growing up. You see, 
We didn't cast the devil out of insanity. I began to preach. Preach three years. Never preached one sermon on how to set people free from demon power. You say, why? I didn't know anything about it. And I went off to New Zealand and Australia and came around to Java. Brother Howard Carter and I were traveling together by that time. We were the only two people traveling before the war that we knew anything about. And, and so uh, he'd preached to one group and I'd preach to another. And there in Surabaya and a great big, great big church. It was an enormous thing. There, they already had a big church in Surabaya. On a high platform with all the dignitaries up there. A little girl slipped off the front pew and began to undulate like a snake on the floor. Green mess come out of her mouth. Eight, ten inches like this. Eyes like tiger eyes. It's frightening. I looked at the pastor. And he counted the lights. He wouldn't look. I'd never seen anything like it. And I, I, I tell you what evangelists do. When they get in a corner and don't know what to do, they start saying, oh, Lord, save souls, oh, Lord, save souls. They don't really mean it. Oh, Lord, save souls, oh, Lord. That's the way they get out of their problem. So I get, did my regular routine when I saw this devil thing going back and forth across there, mocking the platform, spitting out that green mess. I, I'd never seen anything like it, never dreamed about it. All I could say is, Lord, say so. And God spoke back and says, I can't. I says, well, why can't you? He says, that demon is between you and the people. I said, well, move it. He says, move it yourself. And I said, I don't know anything about it. Well, he says, you can't do anything tonight. That, that demon won. I said, they're not going to win. He said, it looks like it to me. I was glad for that long song service, about 50 or 60 minutes. It gave me time to argue with God. What to do about a girl going up and down like a snake, clear across that big auditorium, back and forth, wild eyes and green mess coming out of her mouth. I didn't know what to do. So I finally was called on to preach, and I preached from this side. My interpreter was over here, and I stood up, and I was regular to do like evangelists usually do. Your flowers are so pretty. Your homes are so lovely. Your climate is so wonderful. I'm so delighted to see you. You know, it's a lot of baloney, but they, they feel like they have to start that way, <laughs> being an evangelist. And I, I didn't give them a regular, you know, of telling them how nice they were. When my hand hit this, I screamed. It didn't come out of my head. It came out of my belly. My belly. I said, get up off that... And I scared myself. <laughs> and the interpreter got scared and said nothing. <laughs> but the devil understood English. She wiped that mess off her face. She backed up and sat in the pew like a zombie. She sat there and stared at me while I preached for 45 minutes. I thought it's all over. Yeah, see, I was very ignorant. Never heard any sermons on it. Never read a book on it. There were no books in those days about it. And, and I got ready to give my altar call because I'm an evangelist. And as I did, rather than give him my altar call, I said, come out of her! I said, oh, God, whatever happened to me? You know? You say, what happened? She was healed like that. That's right. Yeah, I was 20 feet away. Healed. Her eyes became straight. Her distorted face became smooth, and she became a beautiful little 12-year-old girl. She laughed, and she turned to her neighbor and began to talk. And I grabbed my interpreter and said, what's she saying? What's she saying? And, and, and he, he, he turned and said, she is saying, where am I, and what am I doing here? And, and while I was listening to that, I, I looked up, and 500 sinners had rushed to the altar to get saved without my asking them to. You say, were you happy about that? I was angry. I went back to the room and I met Brother Howard Carter there. And I said, I'm so mad, I don't know what to do. He said, what are you so angry about? I said, you should have heard me scream. I don't know how it ever got out. And I scared the people I screamed so loud. I want to be a nice evangelist, American evangelist. I don't want to be a screamer. He said, what happened? And I told him, I said, it's awful. He says, I think that little girl must have belonged to the pastor. 
full of the devil. Oh, he said, that, that don't matter. She says, it sounds all right to me. I said, that's because you weren't there. If you would have been there, it was nasty. And I don't like it. I said, I hope it never happens again. Now, that's how ignorant I was of delivering people from that. I'd never heard, never seen it. She was the first person I'd ever seen that was possessed of the devil. And I, man, I built up enough theology there to write a book. You don't have to touch them. You don't have to massage them. You don't have to ask them stupid questions. You just say, come on! I was hoping it would never happen again. <laughs> and the next week we were in another city. And again, the house was packed full. And again, Brother Carter was at another meeting. He always taught on the gifts of the Spirit. And I, I was evangelist and I'd pray for the sick. And uh, came in the church. And my interpreter was a fancy little fellow. I hope some of them get to heaven. And, and so uh, <laughs> they mess up enough sermons, you know. And we were coming and he was in front. And I got about a third of the way down, and a woman caught my coat like a vice. I looked for him. He was on the platform saying, Now, I'm a full-blood Irishman. I was born that way. I wanted to hit her so bad. I wanted to suck her upside the head and said, I'll teach you to leave preachers alone. <laughs> but then I said, well, that sure would be poor news in the paper tomorrow. American evangelist socks the people with his fist. So I said, I better not do that. I said, I could do like Joseph. I could give her the coat. <laughs> but then I said, well, what would the people think of me up there preaching without a coat? And I looked down at her. And she had the most dreadful grin. The devil can grin. He, he doesn't know how to smile, but he can grin. The corners of her mouth scooped down and her face contorted. She said, you have a black angel in you and I have a white angel in me. He, he, he. <laughs> now, I was only a third, a third of the way in and I was ready to go back out, you know? But she had me. I couldn't go anywhere. And now they had even stopped singing to see what was happening to the preacher two-thirds way out of the house. When she said that, I dropped my briefcase. I grabbed her, put one side of my, well, she's still holding on, and the other here, and I screamed. And I said, you lying an unclean spirit. Come out of her! You could hear it a block away. You say, well, why did you scream? Well, the Lord said the devil was hard of hearing. You got to get his attention. The Bible says Jesus spoke with authority. And you don't speak with authority in a whisper. Hallelujah! When I commanded that thing to come out, it took 10 seconds. Her eyes came straight. Her face came straight. She dropped my coat. And I said, woman, what do you mean grabbing a preacher's coat? <laughs> They'd all stopped church now. <laughs> we had the whole church in the back of the building now. <laughs> she said, 15 years ago, I went to a witch doctor over a domestic problem. She says, I've had something right there ever since tormenting me because I didn't want to grab your coat and said really I didn't do it says a devil grabbed it and I said I'll tell you one thing he never will grab anything else of yours as long as you live she said I felt it leave when you said get out of there says this was the first time my belly has been soft like this in 15 years <laughs> you see uh, what, what, what happened who it was easy to preach Man, they got saved by the bushels around there that night. Yeah, it was so easy. I discovered something. See, I was learning. Just, just, just learning. 
didn't have any books or anybody to teach me. And so I was just learning. And, and I was learning that when you cast the devil out, you'd expect a mighty uproar of some kind. You know, that's what Paul found. That's what Jesus found, you know. He, he, he delivered the maniac of the devil and came back. And there was 4,000 people down there wanting to hear him preach and teach. And he had to feed the whole bunch. And he kept them for supper that night. Yeah. And, and so when you deal with the demon power, it loses the people to come to Jesus. So I was learning, learning, yes. excepting I hated it. I went back to the room and I said, I think I'll just go around with you, Brother Carter. I said, why does the devil never fight you? Well, he says, you know, I'm just a teacher. They don't fight teachers. They fight evangelists. I said, oh, wish I was a teacher. But I wasn't. I was just an evangelist, you see. And I said, it won't ever happen anymore. This is enough. And I don't mean maybe. I said, did you know I screamed they could hear me a block away? He said, I'd like to hear that. I said, no, you won't ever hear it. I said, it's awful. And I don't want to do that anymore. I said, I hope it never happens again. Next week. <laughs> in a big, beautiful church. Preached and had a great time. And it was a businessman that was shuffling me between our room and the church and back. And we started to go back to the room. And he said to me, would you go pray for my wife? And I wanted to say, no, I sure won't. I've prayed for enough people for one night. But I didn't know the way back to my house. In that case, you're nice to people. I could leave you on the street all night, you see? So I said, well, I guess so. He led me, he was a prosperous businessman. Led me to this big house of his, opened the door and went in. How many know what the old-fashioned shiffer robe is? You know what the old shiffer robe is? It was before they had walk-in closets. This was the outside closet. Ornate piece of furniture cost a lot of money. You could lock your treasures in there where your kids couldn't steal it. <laughs> Only I found out how to get into ours when I was a boy. Anyway, <laughs> Schifferos are very popular when I was with them. We walked in the front door and he closed the door. His wife was on top of the Schiffero. <laughs> she was crazy. She... She did not have one stitch of clothes on. She was naked. And when we walked in the door, and I looked up, I wanted to go back out the door, you know? But I didn't have time. She screamed at the top of her voice. Now, now these things are almost seven foot high. She dove off of there head first. Whoop! With her hands in front of her, like she was diving. Her long hair flung behind her, and her body naked. That, that businessman caught her in his arms. She never hit the floor. Caught her in his arms, pulled her in the next room, threw a sheet around her, pushed up to me and said, cast it out. <laughs> yeah. I thought I was going home, but I just wasn't going home. I laid my hands upon her, and I said, you insane spirit that's taken away the mind of this woman, and you lustful demon that's infuriated her blood, I command you, come out of there by the blood of Jesus, by the authority of the Great Commission, go! She was healed like that. Just 30 seconds she was healed. She she grabbed that sheet and began to cover her body. He said, go put on some clothes and feed us. Was a crazy woman going to start feeding you? You know? She went in her dressing room, her bedroom, and in five minutes she came out dressed very beautifully. She went in that kitchen, cooked up some food, and we sat and laughed and talked for an hour or two. And when I got back to my room, I said, God, was I made for this? I said, I thought I was going to be an evangelist. I said, I just hate this. I, that would be the strangest tales going around about me. Naked woman, some raw. Oh. <laughs> I just didn't need the reputation was all. 
And like Brother Hagin says on one of his tapes, he's been with many preachers that the only thing they had against me was that I taught about casting out devils. And those preachers didn't know how much I hated it and wanted to be just a normal evangelist, you know. I wasn't to blame for it. I'm only telling you how I learned to do it, you know, against my will. Again, I said, that's ter terrible. I decided, I said, you Javanese got a strange disease down here, that's all. When I get out of here, I won't ever see this anymore. And we got on the boat and went to Singapore. And they had it too. <laughs> and almost every meeting. And we went to Hong Kong and they had it too. And we went to Tibet. And almost everywhere I went, the devil was growling and yelling and screaming. And I was casting him out. With no, no, no training, you see. God was doing the training. And, and no loving it. I wasn't saying, man, isn't this a ministry? No, I was saying, oh, God, deliver me from this mess. <laughs> yeah. That might have been happen, what happened when the disciples saw Jesus cast out the, the 2,000 demons out of the demoniac, you see. They're saying, hey, don't ever get messed up that kind of ministry. Let him have it. You know. But the Lord Jesus, in his last words on this earth, said, they that have faith shall cast out devils. Well, I, I went on through the Orient, right up through Japan, a whole year just through that area, and everywhere I went, the devils were screaming and yelling and crawling, and, and I had to cast devils out. And I didn't want to, and I didn't do it except when they disturbed my meetings. I never did go out looking for any. I, I, if they disturbed my meeting, I went after them because I love souls, and I won't let them disturb my meeting. When Brother Carter and I got on the Trans-Siberian Express to come across Siberia and Russia, I said, well, thank God. <laughs> he left all that mess behind in, in the Orient. Boy, they really in a mess over there. I'm just glad to get out of there. And I said, you know, I'm never going back. Don't ever say that. That's where you'll spend the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah, don't ever be telling God where you won't go. You'll be on Main Street over there. We got into Europe and to Poland, where we just came from. And the great city of Lodz, again, Brother Carter was preaching in one place, and I was preaching in another place, buildings packed full of people, having a great time. And in this service, full of people, on the front seat was a woman. And as soon as they started singing, she began to say, Hallelujah! I don't believe that's Polish. I looked around the pastor and he... I looked for the ushers and they weren't there. I said, God, why don't somebody stop that crazy woman? For 45 minutes, every 10 or 15 seconds, she yelled hallelujah in a different way. It was the most disturbing mess you've ever seen. And I said, God, why do I have to get like this, Lord? Help us, Lord. I said, I can't preach for that old hallelujah on the front seat. But I was going to try. They finally gave me the pulpit, and my interpreter was always on this side, and I took this side. And I stood up and put my hand there. And I was going to tell them how nice they were. You know, the evangelist, nice you are. <laughs> Exaggerated nice, you know, that evangelists love to do. Anyway, I was ready for that. And rather than saying that, I said, shut up! And I screamed again. It was like Java. And it came out of my belly, not out of my head. And I said, oh, Lord. The interpreter said nothing. He was scared, too. You say, did she shut up? No. She began to bark like a dog. Wow, wow, wow. Wow, 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 wow. I said, oh, 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 God. What a mess I've made. The, the, the barking is worse than the hallelujahs. And then here came the ushers. They, they walked in twos. I got so angry, I didn't know what to do. They didn't show up until this mess. The hallelujahs were all right. It was the barking they didn't like. 
I grabbed my interpreter and I said, go back and sit down. <laughs> I leaned over the pulpit and I said, you unclean spirit, come out of there now by the blood of Jesus. She was healed. Just like that. Healed. Just like that. We had an amazing move of God there. I said, Lord, I thought this was just in the Orient. We went to France and Germany and England and Holland. And everywhere we went, there were people possessed of the devil. You say, well, you got trained, did you? No, I was too ignorant to get trained. I said, now, this is the European disease. They got it too. They must have caught it from those people over in China. I still hadn't caught on to them. I'd been reading Pentecost all my life. I said, I know one thing. We don't have any of this in America. I lived over there all my life. And I said, I'd just be glad to go home and behave myself. Brother Carter and I crossed the Atlantic and came to the States for a few weeks before going on into South America. I went to see my brother who was a pastor in St. Louis. And the pastor from Alton says, uh, 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 come over and preach for me on Sunday. And I said, fine, we'll be glad to. So we went over to the Assembly of God Church in Alton and had a good Sunday morning service. And he took me out for a good roast beef dinner. That makes the preachers feel so good. I got in the car to go back to the room and he said, uh, would you go and pray for my, one of my young people? I want to say no so bad I didn't know what to do. Man, I had already preached and had a roast beef dinner. I was ready for a, a, a Spanish siesta. <laughs> and I wanted to say, take care of your own work. I'm doing mine. But again, I couldn't help myself. I said, I guess so. We drove to a typical little Midwestern home, three or four rooms made of wood. Lovely little porch, rocking chair, and a swing. He opened the door, and we walked in. And I'll tell you the rest of it when I come back. Would you like to hear it, Billy Joe? Yes, sir. Well, the rest of them can listen. I'll tell it to you. <laughs> I saw a woman, a mother, kneeling on the floor. Her son sitting in a straight chair. And she was feeding that man food with a spoon, and he was swallowing it. And she began to say as we entered, Oh, son, speak to mama. Oh, son, speak to mama. Oh, son, speak to mama. And I was looking, and I saw that same grin that I saw in Java. Same one. Curled up lips at the bottom down here. I saw that same crazy gaze of glee in a demonic face. I'll tell it how it happened first. This Assembly of God boy, 25 or 6 years old, one of his friends says, if you'll go to me over to a spiritist meeting, we'll put our thumbs and fingers together and we'll raise the table 12 inches off the floor. He says, let's go. And so they went over and joined with some other spiritists to, to make the table come off the floor. Now you play with the devil, and you'll get it. If you don't believe it, you'll get it. They found him the next morning on the porch. No shirt, no undershirt. Gashes in his back from his buttocks to his shoulder. Deep as if a tiger had come across his back. They pulled him inside and laid him on a bed. He couldn't speak a word. For six months, he never said a word again. And his body became like a machine. You put it like this, 12 hours later, still there. Put his foot up in the air, 10 hours later, still there. Didn't bother him at all. Lay him down in bed, 12 hours later, he hadn't moved an inch, just like you put him in. But if you put food in his mouth, soft food, he would swallow it. If you put water into his mouth, he would drink it. But he never said a word, never responded in any way. Now, I can't I tell you the story. The pastor told me about it. 
He said that when he closed the door and I saw that boy with that demonic grin on his face mocking his mother because she was saying, speak to me. You don't ever beg the devil for anything. We're not beggars. We're rulers. She was begging, speak to mama. <laughs> speak to mama, please. He hadn't said a word in over six months. The pastor said, Brother Summer, I never saw anything like it. He says, you rose up off the floor and you came down on top of him in the middle of the room and you grabbed him and you said, come out of him. And then you said, speak to your mother. And he turned and said, Mama, I'm so sorry. Mama, I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. And he was healed from that moment. Well, this was just part of the doctrine I'm giving you. I said, this thing's in America. Oh, God. How do you get over here? It's in America. Are you here tonight? Yes. You know why I'm in America? God sent me home. Are you here? He said there would be a hundred million Americans who would need deliverance from demon power. You're the only people God's got. That's right. These denominational people are not going to cast anything out. No matter whether they're Pentecostal or what they are. They're determined to be sedate. And the devil loves it. He'll polish your shoes for you. A hundred million. Psychologists and psychiatrists met in, 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 in San Francisco last year. And when they gave their press release, they said there was between 30 and 35 million Americans who need psychiatric help right now. They might have missed a few. Can you imagine? 30 to 35 million Americans. Now, I'll tell you something that I'm not proud of. There's never a Sunday morning, because I'm always at home, unless I'm overseas, I'm in South Bend every Sunday. Every Sunday morning, they're there from all over the land to be set free. They were there last Sunday morning. There was a man there from Nevada who said, I traveled all this way. Will you set me free, please? There was a woman there. She was from over in Ohio. Says, can you set me free, please? A few weeks ago, Paul Crouch took his jet, flew it from Los Angeles to South Bend with one of his friends, his Brother Sumrall. I don't know of anybody in America that can set him free but you. I said, I don't like that. I believe all God's people can set anybody free. He said, I don't know of anybody to set anybody free. I prayed for the man and set him free completely. Set him free. Paul went right back out the airport, got in his Lear, flew back out there. You say, were you happy? Oh, no, I was mad. I said, oh, God. Here, here the man spent maybe $3,000 just in fuel. To bring a man clear across, 2,000 over, 2,000 back, just for a 20-minute prayer. I said, God, that shouldn't be. And God said, I don't want it to be. I want my people to have faith. And in these last days, people are going to give themselves to demon power. They're going to do it through sex. Millions of Americans are possessed with demon spirits tonight of lust that just, just, they can't live with one man or one woman. They, they just full of lust, you know. Demons of lust can't be satisfied. As sure as you're in this room tonight, millions of Americans are going to be filled with a spirit of gambling, of lottery. America's crazy. The Irish have been having gambling over there, national gambling, ever since I was born. And for that, they're the poorest, miserable people on the face of the earth. You, you can't have prosperity with sin. It's like opening up a brothel in order to, to pave a street. Yeah. You, you better build yourself a bigger jail and a bigger penitentiary and a bigger insane asylum. You'll need them all. The wages of sin is death and not life. And God said, tell my people, they've got to set people free. You've come to this great convention here to go home and set people free. 
You, you say, but, 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 but. Shut up. There are no buts about this. You read the Bible. You say what the Bible says. You say, but, but what if they don't get delivered? That's none of your business. It's your business to, to cast them out. You say, but haven't you seen some that you prayed for and they weren't delivered? Maybe so. I don't stick around. When I say come out, I just go. And if they look like they're not delivered, I said, I'll come back and hurt you. They said, well, I better leave then. They don't want a second one. You see, everybody here can set people free. There are going to be more broken minds in this country and broken down emotions. God only knows the millions of people in this land that are on strong drugs tonight because they can't hold themselves together. They can't do it. God wants an army of mighty deliverers. Mighty deliverers. Not one in California and one in Indiana. No. Oh, no. He wants every pastor to be a deliverer. He wants all the deacons to be deliverers. He wants all the members to be deliverers. You don't have to find everybody that's in trouble and say, come let me take care of my pastor. Do it yourself. Amen. It's your job. Do it yourself. Amen. You don't have to come dragging them into the pastor's office. It's your job. And when you have faith, it works. It works. I've given you 50 years of history. It works. It works all over the world. In Poland, we laid our hands in the middle of the belly of those people, and they got delivered, not knowing a word of English. <laughs> they got delivered in English. The Polish did. You see? You say, what? Well, the devil, he knows all these, all these languages. I've had people in other countries that didn't know any English. I started to pray for them. The devil was speaking English and said, listen, I know you. I said, you just think you do. Just wait a minute. Yeah. I'll give you a lesson. You won't be telling me anymore you know me. I say, come out of there by the blood of Jesus, and they're gone. Yeah, I don't want to know them and have no communication with them. Right. Right. Yes. Don't ever have any communication with the devil. Thousand times he said to me, let me show you my face. It's beautiful. I said, yeah, the Bible says that you're like an angel of light. You're a deceiver. I said, I don't want to see you. Many times the devil said, let me show you. Let me show you. I said, no, 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 no. And, and people want to talk. I said, shut up. You don't talk in my presence. They want to vomit. I, I just grab and say, if you puke, I'll pick it up. I'll ram it down your throat. You might as well keep it in there now. We didn't come here to work on your body. We came here to work on your spirit. You better know it. We're dealing with spirits. We're not dealing with bodies. And they have to obey you if you know anything. They have to obey you. But it's not enough for one or two to share a burden like that. The whole church should set people free. You say, how can you do it? Well, I think we should live right, live clean. Yes. An unclean person cannot cast out an unclean spirit. We have to live clean. We have to believe the Word. If the Word says it'll work, it'll work. So you go on the Word, not how you feel about it. You go on the Word. And then you don't have to do it like some other preacher who may be doing it wrong. You do it like the Bible. I began to study every instance that Jesus cast out spirits. I said, I want to do it just like Jesus. I never read a book. I've never read a book yet about it, by anybody's book, you know. Just read the Bible on it. And, and, and every case is a little different. And so I just do whatever the Bible says. The Word of God is our teacher. And if you follow the Word, don't, you don't ask me your questions. Read how Jesus did it and how Paul did it. And you'll have the answer to any question on demon power. But God wants you to be free. There are people here tonight that need to be set free. God brought you here to be free. And you'll be free tonight. In Jesus' name. Would you bow your heads, please?